The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. Welcome to Sakpa. This is the 56th year. I am your moderator today. My name is Klaus Jericho. <clears throat> we have an unusual topic today. I'm so pleased to see so many of you come out. I know Gordon Campbell would have really approved of this title because he's so interested in society and how it functions or how it doesn't function. Um, so in introduction, I would like to uh, make some comments uh, or uh, to give you a story about in support of indigenous recognition, which is close to our hearts. And I have an example of a historic achievement <coughs> which took place right here in southern Alberta. Clued and I, we've been to this site. It's an astronomy site which is 5,000 years old. And it's located about an hour north of uh, Lomond in Alberta. We went there two years ago and it is a beautiful location. It's a, essentially a pile of rocks from which the locals 5,000 years ago determined the light pattern at summer solstice and winter solstice. They had enough vision to recognize that this can be done and they actually did it. So when we saw that site, I was overwhelmed. To do that in the winter time or in the summer time and to achieve it and to know the vision for it and the understanding of it was 5,000 years ago. I was, just, I was just blown away. And not only I was blown away, but Gordon Freeman, he's a professor of chemistry at the University of Alberta, he was. <coughs> and he wanted to confirm and learn from them as to how they did it. And he did that. And he wrote a book about it called The Canadian Stonehenge. The Canadian Stonehenge is 500 years older than the one in Britain. And it's right here in Alberta. So I find that, <coughs> I find it totally impressive that those people 5,000 years ago did that and knew how to do it. So I thought in recognition, I tell you this story, which is right here in Alberta. Oh, okay, so um, I, for the benefit of the viewers, I, I want to let them know the format. Uh, the speaker, James Moore, will be speaking for about 25 minutes. And then we have questions and answers after. And uh, at one o'clock, we will be finished. And um, the, uh, uh, and I let you know that the uh, session is recorded. It will be available on SACPA's website, YouTube channel, and shown on Rogers TV community channel. Okay, now to the introduction to the speaker. I tell you a little story there too. Uh, James and I, we were at a book reading by Lorne Fitch at Analog Bookstore a few weeks ago. <coughs> and at the end of it, James, in the discussion period, James made a comment, he says, society, it's not, it's not a real thing. And I thought to myself, oh God, I never heard that before. So I better phone him. So then I learned that he was not so much interested in the, the, whether society is or is not a real thing. He was interested in the slogan of it. 
and in its impact on society. And I thought, oh, well, this is, this is different. And I thought to him, James, would you mind giving us a talk at Sakpa about that? And he said, yes. So that's the history of how this came about. It's an unusual subject, and I'm so pleased to see so many of you here. And um, <coughs> James, if you want to come up and tell us all about the impact of slogans on society, please. Good afternoon. Okay. Sanatapi. You notice um, we're in Nitsatapi territory here. I asked how you were. But if you listen and watch a little bit where we are, you'll see often if I'm answering in Nitsatapi, the question how I am, they'll say Iksukapi, and there'll be this hand signal. Iksukapi. And this means, I think, things are in balance. Iksukapi. Yeah. Iksukapi. So, it's a, it's a very good uh, insight into a healthy world, an interconnected life world, and how humans can get along if things are in balance. <clears throat> now, Klaus is really, really close to the mark as to how I got here today. I asked, um, Lauren Fitch was speaking very eloquently as his want on the importance of water in a semi-arid climate and why the eastern slopes are so important and why biodiversity has to be protected. But he also spoke to how we should think of ourselves as ancestors and think of the world we inherit and what we're going to leave for the children of the future. And if you think of yourself as an ancestor in that regard, then you're conscious of where you are, how it is, and the children of the future are going to get what we leave. So we should try at least to leave it as good as we get it, and more importantly, try to leave it better. And I just, you know, at the very end of the presentation in the question period, I said, what about Margaret Thatcher's comment that there is no such thing as society. Now, Lauren is very quick on his mental feet, and he immediately batted that south of the border. This was just before the election. And then Klaus phoned me and said, you know, a little bit more. So um, I'm going to start with um, two examples of a slogan, like there is no such thing as society, and another one from Thatcher, the government has no money of its own. And the third one was, there is no alternative. And she was speaking to the, at that time, what would be called the globalization phenomenon of capitalism, where they imagined, uh, you know, that sort of colonization and plundering of the life world was inevitable and it was profitable and that there was no alternative to it. Um, and I want to challenge those two and hopefully go a little further into um, the human, our responsibility for the world today and tomorrow. Um, the first thing I'd like you to do, can everyone take a Canadian coin out of their purse or pocket and put it on the table right now? Any kind of Canadian coin. No credit card. I want... Yes, but, but before you get there, I want to tell you what you see in the context of there's no such thing as society and the government has no money of its own to begin with. 
If you look on the coin, and I can tell you this without looking myself, but I want you to look at it, and you're going to see D, G, Regina, if it's Queen Elizabeth. If you happen to have uh, one of the new king, it'll say D, G, Rex. And if you have one pre-1947, with Queen Elizabeth's father, you'll see DG Rex at end Emp. And do you, know, do you all know what that means? Or should I tell you? <laughs> okay, the DG is Dia Gratia. This is Latin for by the grace of God. Uh, Rex is king, Regina is queen. And et in emp means and the emperor of India. Okay? So you could presume that somebody like Margaret Thatcher would be able to imagine that there was, in fact, something like society. Because, first of all, how could she decide to send her warships to retake the Falklands, which Argentina called the Malvinas, if there wasn't such a thing as England, and if there was just a bunch of individuals, you know, sort of carving out their individual greed for themselves, which is kind of the mentality of that worldview she espoused, isn't it a total contradiction? Like, how could there be England if there's no society? And when you look at those coins, you can see a lot of history there. A history where um, the justification for the type of society is actually stamped on the coin. So this is uh, 2024. But the idea that by the grace of God, there is a, a royalty, there is a king. I mean, if this was let's say the 16th century, and I was talking like this, challenging whether such a thing could be true, there were probably laws in place, would be somebody dragging me off to be drawn and quartered for challenging that it was not so. And I think we need to be asking these questions and challenging these assumptions and slogans because if we don't, they kind of take on a life of their own and you can see the metastasization of it. I want to bring another context into this. Um, uh, and that's, like, how many of you think that there's a Nobel Prize in economics? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, this was one of the uh, props that this, this neoliberal viewpoint that Thatcher and Reagan espoused, which is kind of metastasized right now into the distortion we see south of the border right now. And part of the way that that worked was the um, the, the Nobel Prizes uh, created by Alfred Nobel in his will in 1895, where he was looking for the betterment of humankind. So he created prizes in physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and peace. And the Nobel Prize has this cachet, like it's kind of the highest prize in the field. And it, it, the Erzatz Nobel, or the false Nobel, as I would call it, was created in, I think, 1968 by the Swedish bank in the mem it was called In the Memory of Alfred Nobel, and this was resisted by his descendants. But they wanted to pretend that there is some sort of a betterment of mankind and some sort of, um, you know, uh, Nobel Prize, that they could call it that. So, and, and so that started sort of look, creating a justification in what we might call the ascendancy of psychopathy or the cult of individualism, or the kind of things that Thatcher espoused. Um, now, in the beginning, there were winners like Milton Friedman, 
like Friedrich von Hayek and the start of the Chicago School of Economics. And they're pushing for this um, idea that, that there is no society, that there is no social organization, that the best we can do is compete individually and somehow it'll all work out. Well, if we look at the world we're living today, we can see that it isn't working out. Um, and there's a, a lot of crises, a lot of fear, a lot of um, loneliness to the point where it's a determinant of health considered worse than smoking now. Now imagine, I want you to, to uh, uh, time? I, I'm needing, okay. So um, just imagine for a moment, we can try to step a little bit away from our kind of narrow focus on the, you know, the needs of being alive, working, eating, cleaning, all of that, functioning in a society somehow, and go a little further out. Now we think about humans who go into space, wherever they're from, if they go out far enough and they look back, they see this, this special, precious planet, and that's all we have, and they don't see any borders. And they realize, there's like a kind of a revelation they get, that we share this precious earth together. And how are we going to do that? That kind of thinking, uh, that kind of viewpoint is far beyond this, you know, quarterly profit statement which drives much of the economy and much of the, the world, what's happening now. And that's far too narrow of a focus. We need to step beyond that. Um, so just imagine for a moment, you're coming from even further out, and you see this planet, and you see these 8 billion humans on it. And you start looking at how they behave and what they do to each other. And you would notice that they keep slaughtering each other, and they've done this apparently for 16,000 years. I mean, we, if we look at our own recent history, if we look back, and somehow they imagine it benefits them. Like, like wouldn't that be hard to comprehend if you, if you were trying to take some kind of objective point of view of this? Are we, how, how are we a learning deficiency? Like, is there another possible direction than that? And why does that happen? And you really think in terms of a generalized statement, and I'm the first to admit that generalizations aren't true, including this one. But there's an accuracy, a form of accuracy there, and that would be where I would say wars, generally, are where people who don't know each other kill each other. For people who know each other, and don't kill each other. And a big advantage of wars or, or creation of enemies, so that rather than seeing that we share the earth, all of us, is that if you have a closed society, an enclosure, and then you can mistreat your own people in a system of inequality, in a system of ex exploitation, but if you tell them there's an enemy outside of them that needs to be feared, that's dangerous, that, that those other people aren't in fact people at all, then it gives you the power to control them much better. Rather than uh, recognizing the, the truth is that we're all here together, we humans. And it's up to us it's our responsibility, what happens, and what we're going to do. And this is, a, you know, a, a, an amazing truth. And I think the reason I asked that question of Lauren was because I really liked what he was saying and what he's trying to do with his knowledge and the importance of water in a semi-arid climate like ours. And 
then you have all of these sort of false narratives or denial of that, you know, where somehow, the, 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 as an example, uh, the richest billionaire in Australia doesn't have enough money. And we're, we're supposed to respect the trauma that she feels from not being rich enough to the point that she wants to put a coal mine in Crow's Nest Past. And even though we're in a semi-arid climate and we recognize that the water in the Old Man River is getting down and we recognize the danger of selenium where tech corporation actually got, a, I think it was a $62 million fine a year or two ago and because that's an international waterway and can nobody see that this isn't a good idea, that the, the health of the ecosystem, the livelihood of the human beings, the integrity of the water, the biodiversity are more important than this poor billionaire who doesn't have enough money yet. And I think that pretty well hits the nail on the head. But of course, it's not expressed in such a succinct fashion because we're vulnerable, we have a vulnerability to slogans that aren't examined. Um, and as far as uh, government having, and, and did you see the DG on your coins? Like, do you think that it's by the grace of God that the king is the king? This was really convenient 500 years ago because as a way of explaining how things are in society. Um, and I would argue that this um, trope from the neoliberals, Thatcher, Reagan, and so on, all the way through, is also not true. Um, I want to go speak a bit about, uh, I've mentioned what I call the social debt and social obligation of humans. We inherit the history of what other humans have left us, the marvels of the world, um, you know, the, the, the way we've organized ourselves. Um, Medicare in Canada, for example, Tommy Douglas, nine years old, uh, going to lose his leg, and he overhears a chief surgeon talking about, uh, he wants to bring uh, medical students to observe how he saves the leg. If Tommy's parents would agree, then he would do it for free. And Tommy thought, this isn't right. We must be able to organize ourselves such that nobody has to lose their leg if they don't have some money. That led us to where we are today, but the challenge from the other side is there's so much profit to be made because health is so precious. You know, if your health is threatened or your mother or your child or your neighbor or your friend, what does money matter? That's why most of the bankruptcies in the United States are because of medical bills. And, and, and this needs to be, we have to be conscious of our choices in this regard because we, we do have those choices to make. Um, and I want to mention, when I was teaching <coughs> in the School of Justice Studies at Rethbridge College, I was asked to write a course on social justice. And the book I chose kind of as a text for that course, was, is called The Spirit Level. It's a book by epidemiologist Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, and it, it shows how the deleterious effects of inequal societies on the humans living there. And it says that in 11 different health and social problems, the outcomes are worse in more unequal countries, whether they're rich countries or poor countries. And just as one example in the book, um, uh, the, the mental health, and, and, and think about this for a moment, outcomes in Denmark at the time of writing, this is a more, much more equal society than the United States in terms of distribution of resources in terms of universal access to post-secondary education, which isn't charged there, et cetera. 
One in 10 people in Denmark have some kind of mental health problem in their lives, and one in four in the United States. All that that means. The course tells me I have only a few minutes, so I'm gonna leap ahead here. Um, so, a couple things. One is, I'm going to tell you something that's true of all of you. And it's also true of every other of the eight billion of us humans on this planet. And you're going to agree with me when I tell you. Every one of you, every one of us, when we appear, when we're born here, all we have to survive is love and trust. Nothing is more helpless than a human baby. This should be an advantage to our being able to organize ourselves. Yesterday was called World Kindness Day. Yeah, why don't we have World Kindness Year? And maybe have, I don't know, Capitalist Day or something. <laughs> You know what I mean? But um, there's so many things, like uh, James Baldwin is a genius, um, found him, and, and, and he's an incredible writer, but he also has some beautiful comments on the world and the humans. Here's one. We are responsible for the world in which we find ourselves, if only because we are the only sentient force which can change it. And here's another from James Baldwin. The children are always ours, every single one of them, all over the world. And I am beginning to suspect that whoever is incapable of recognizing this may be incapable of morality. And I want us to think about that in the context of what's possible. When, when Thatcher says there is no alternative, she's just simply demonstrating the blindness and ignorance of that whole economic philosophy. Of course, there are alternatives. <clears throat> and I think the biggest hurdle, in a way, <clears throat> in the world we live in, because that cult of individualism, that von Hayekian, Friedman Knight, globalization worldview, pits individuals against each other, and it also makes you feel that it's hopeless, because you're just one person, and look how the world is stacked against everything. I think that when we start to see that change is possible, that it's up to us, and the realization that it is possible gives this incredible lift, you know, this, this sense of hope and this ability to try things, to learn together, which is the best way to learn, to share knowledge, and to decide, you know, we're going to look after this earth and each other, and we can do it. It's possible. Um, and I just want to say something at the end about carbon capture and storage, because we're hearing all this pathways and how, you know, the governments have only spending 62% of the cost and it's an unproven thing anyway and blah, blah, blah. Here's the story about carbon capture and storage. It's been done. Okay? It's been done a billion years ago. The way we got to this planet, how it is, how it's our precious life world for us oxygen breathers was because the plants were there before us and they captured and they stored the carbon. And there it sits. It's fine. It's safe there. It's been captured and stored. So leave it there and we'll be fine. I mean, isn't that obvious enough? Carbon capture and storage. It's not a, uh, 
And, and, and in the context of where we are, do we have a minute to talk about war, or is that enough? Enough? Okay. Sorry. Uh, I didn't know I only had 25 minutes. I thought I had 25 days, but thank you very much. <laughs> Very good, James. You sure made us think about our days and our, our togetherness uh, in a very personal manner. And I'm sure we all have had thoughts because while he was talking, so please formulate your thoughts and come up with short comments and even shorter questions and line up here and please contribute to the unusual s session session today. Uh, as I said before, Gordon Campbell would have been very pleased to hear what you had said to James. Um, so please come up. Um, in the meantime, I'll let you know that um, membership to SACPA is available at $30 for the year. And um, there's a suggestion box available for you, and there are these donation jars available to use the coins which he asked you to, to, to use. Um, and uh, we thank um, the U of L and the Rogers TV for their valuable support. Thank you for also to the Lesbridge Herald and other media for their coverage. Uh, Next week's speaker is an unusual one again. It's, the, um, it's Paul Woods from the uh, Wilson Hutterite colony. And the title is, after 106 years, how the diversity and self-efficiency, self-sufficiency keep the Wilson Hutterite colony viable. There is a society that seems to be doing what James is advocating <laughs> to be kind to each other. So, Henning, will you be the first one to ask the question? So, are you going to answer the questions or are going to have to go back up? Yeah, yeah, no, come up now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Henning Mundel. <coughs> James, the the title that Klaus had given you is The Dangers of, uh, uh, read it again, uh, of Slogans and Populism. Could you just briefly define populism and how we can uh, be dangerous both on the right and on the left? Uh, not a week's talk. <laughs> okay, so it comes from the same root as popular, so it's about people. Um, and I think it's a little bit awkward because if a whole bunch of people are busy with the same idea or the same slogan, then you could say it's popular, and then you could turn that into a verb and label it, label it populism. But I think, um, I guess, on the right, on the left, so I'll just say this. Um, uh, when a society is crumbling in many different ways, often through inequality, because all of these things become more and more difficult, but the people living there searching for some solution to the difficult way that the life is unfolding, historically there's been a uh, a cult of what we call fascism or something like that, where you appeal to a strong leader who's going to save you all. And then there's the social aspect where, because we are social beings, we cannot survive as individuals. You know, there's the part about belonging to a group and feeling comfortable within that group and sharing with that group. And if you go outside of the group's kind of perception, you'll be shunned and you'll be alone again. So the identity with that group, you know, that can also be called populism, and then you build this thing, and then if you feed it, you know, through a lot of money and propaganda, like the MAGA cult in the United States, for example, 
And then you have this idea that there's this leader who's going to save you. Well, I guess, you know, we thought it re reached its culmination in the Nazi Zeit, where you had what was called the Führer Prinzip, the leader principle. So there was one guy who could, you know, sort of have all the answers and all the decisions correct, and everything would flow from him down. And this is sort of the repetition of that in the United States now, because it's actually the leader principle. If you, if you look at how they're organizing, and while it's popular, I think there was 75 million people who voted for that. But whether they, and I doubt that they've analyzed all that it means. It's more like, um, you know, it's, it's, it makes them part of a group. I mean, I'm sure they enjoy themselves. They, they share laughter. They, they give each other kindness, distorted by their hatred of something else often. But within their little group, you know, they've created a, a society and it's populist. I don't know if that helps or answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh. My name's Barb Phillips. Uh, I'd like to bring it a bit closer to home, to Canada. And two days ago, a very good premier of British Columbia passed away. And I used to be a big follower on Twitter, but I'm giving that up because of who owns X now or Twitter. But in any case, I kind of would like you to comment on how we have become a me, not a we society, in that when the Premier of British Columbia died just on Tuesday, the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada tweeted out, on behalf of common sense conservatives, I would like to extend my condolences to the family. He didn't even name the family personally, why he had to put that slogan in, common sense conservatives, when you are giving to a family that has just gone through three bouts of cancer and lost their, lost their loved ones, uh, it, it kind of points to a me society, not a we, if we can't even give condolences to someone and some family that has lost a loved one. So your comments, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I'd say that one of the deficiencies in uh, Pierre Poilievre's uh, analysis is that he hasn't had a job in his life yet. I mean, discounting that he's been a professional politician for, you know, since he was, what, 24 years old or something like that, and dabbled in it on the way there. So, common sense, this is a dangerous slogan. It's been used a lot. Um, often it, it describes a lack of analysis, like a, a simplification of something. And I think if we look uh, back to you know, the, the, the false Nobel Prize, if you have a Nobel Prize in physics, for example, you have to look at how the understanding, and this is humans learning together, how our understanding of the universe works. So you have, for example, um, the heresy of suggesting that the Earth goes around the sun, when everybody knows the sun goes around the Earth, right? This is common sense. You get up in the morning and you see the sun, and then in the evening you see it go down, and obviously it's going around the Earth. Okay, this is the kind of common sense that the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada is talking about. <laughs> and now, when you challenge the orthodoxy, there, there is, um, you know, kind of a status quo where the people who control, dominate, hold the purse strings of society, the billionaires who are manipulating South and were defeated North, um, so, challenge, the Earth doesn't go around the Sun. The Sun goes around the Earth. Galileo said no, building on Copernicus. No, we can prove, we can see that the Earth is going around the Sun. He had to retract 
and he was put under house arrest for the rest of his life just to keep an eye on him for this heresy. He got off easy. Giordani Bruno, who suggested that the stars and our sun were very similar, were in fact all stars. He didn't retract and was burned at the stake. So the, the, the sort of trust in the climate scientists are telling us all to be concerned. I think that's well placed because of that way humans learn and the way we can share knowledge and check if our hypothesis is correct or not. Whereas some simple slogan like axe the tax or make America great again, I mean, that's just, you know, is that enough? What does that possibly mean? Unless, I think they might have been spelling great, G-R-A-T-E. Hi, my name is Knut Peterson. Uh, thanks very much, James, for digging deep. Uh, it's a serious topic, for sure. Speaking about slogans, how do you think, uh, let's fix democracy by instituting proportional representation. Do you think that would be a, a good start to work towards a more uh, compassionate society, if there is a society? <laughs> Uh, because it, it seems like uh, the countries that have proportional representation, every vote really does count. Um, and they seem to have a little bit more participation in democracy as well. I know in Denmark, for example, we spoke about Denmark, but if its uh, voting percentage is less than 85%, they start to worry. So do you think... Uh, that model would uh, be able to improve the situation we have in, in this world. <coughs> well, I'll give a short answer to that one, Knud. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but just um, as, a, as a kind of a codicil, we had a promise from the existing liberal leader, that he would institute proportional representation. And I think uh, that, you know, there's this thing about power, you know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. <clears throat> at those higher levels of power, there's other forces at play, other voices guarding the status quo. And so, I mean, it would have been really fascinating if proportional representation had been instituted in Canada. And I agree with a lot of what you say, including the part that in countries like several European countries that have proportional representation, the people in their parliaments actually have to talk together and they have to compromise. And as strange as it might seem, the other guy might have a good idea once in a while. And, and, and we'd all be better off if that kind of, um, you know, tr trying in a, <clears throat> in a kind of a experimental way of organizing ourselves like democracy, but we're working towards, um, you know, power to the people, democratos, that it's better than the king is the king by divine right. Without proportional representation, you're kind of heading back towards that king of divine right. With proportional representation, you're more accurately trying to reflect what the people want, and you're also giving that power to them in that sense. Because it is a better idea, I think. Yes. Hi, James. Thank you very much for being here. I can remember that I'm Bev Mundlatherstone. The, the first time I met or heard James was when he was running for MLA for Lethbridge e West. Yes. 
And I thought, oh, how did Lethbridge, how did someone like this come to Lethbridge? As you could hear today. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for contributing to our understanding about how to recognize the misinformation and slogans. This week, Science Up First has many sessions on how to recognize and counter misinformation. So you asked why we kill each other. Our strongest life-saving response is flight or fight. We can be socialized to channel this fear into positive energy, compassion, and empathy. But when you control education and the media, you can channel this fight into blame and rage. Could you relate this to the comments you wanted to tell us on war? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I think... Um, I'll talk a bit about uh, a Cameroonian philosopher named Achila Mbembe. He's won this year's Holberg Prize. And he speaks to, he, talk, he talks about the sacrament of war in relationship to enclosure and then the creation of an enemy. But he also talks on the other side in a very positive way about the reciprocity of human relationships. So. On the one hand, you have the creation of an enemy, which serves to perpetuate the status quo and make it easier to control a given society or country. In that case, you need to sort of dehumanize whoever your enemy is. And that sort of gives you license because they're not human like you to do what you like with them. Mbembe is really busy with what he calls, one of his books is called Necropolitics, where he talks about, necro means corpse, so corpse politics. A good example is, you know, you probably heard of Mike Lynch, who drowned in the Mediterranean six weeks ago or so. A billionaire, his yacht tipped over. He was in the news for a week or two. But you don't know, you don't have a clue of any name of the thousands of people who've drowned in the Mediterranean seeking asylum. So this is necropolitics. This is the way that developed. The other side of this is recognizing each other as human beings and having that beautiful reciprocity of relationships where you can share ideas, you can share food, you can share music, you can share dance, you can share art, you can be wonderstruck by all of the diversity which we 8 billion have. And we need to go in that direction rather than the other. So. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, I'm very thankful that you gave me the opportunity to ask one more question. James, uh, I'm wondering if the majority of people in this world, I'm starting to think, is not born to be kind. Kindness is something that you learn for many people, I think. You, all you have to do is observe how cruel children can be to each other in the playground. I don't, I, I, I don't think that people are born, everybody is born to be kind. And taking that to the next level, what you see in this world today, <coughs> unless they've learned to be cruel, they certainly aren't kind to each other. Well, that's a longer answer than we probably have time for, but I can touch on it. Um, there's a relationship to the type of society, I think, and what the type of education that's given. So in this context, and in trying to answer your question, Knud, 
Um, a very interesting, uh, I, went, I was in Whitehorse in the Yukon in September, and I went to a lecture or a talk or something. It was called Illuminating Life Worlds or something like that. And there were two elders from indigenous nations. And there's a really interesting new idea that I hadn't heard, but they talked about the lack of emotional education. And they talked about the emphasis on cognitive in our K-12 system and how, um, in a way, debilitating this creates people because if you don't have awareness of your emotional reality, and, and they very well spoken. One of them had a PhD in our sciences as well as his uh, traditional knowledge. And they spoke so clearly about this that I was able to understand a little bit of it, I think. And for example, anger. They talked about the physiological manifestations, how quickly it appears. And if, you don't, if you're not aware of that, how it distorts your perception and how you might act in that emotional state without understanding it compared to if you had some education about this is how your body works, this is what happens with anger. And, and they were advocating this should start in the very beginning of school. And they brought into it examples. And one person had an example, and if you're talking about children being mean, um, in one way, I would say that's also a reflection of what their experience is of the world. But in another way, this one person's child had been bullied at school. I think she was in grade seven, he said. So he went to the principal to talk about this. And the principal said, well, they learned it at home. And his answer to the principal was, why are you saying that? You've had them in your school for seven years. Is there, and then they went into the part about the curriculum and there's no room for this and all of that kind of stuff. But I think that speaks partially to that. Secondly, I would say, um, you know, we, we live in a world in which trauma is visited in various ways on all of us. Um, we can create a healthier, kinder, more stable world. I don't think, I would, would not accept as many people say, there's a human nature and that we are violent, belligerent, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's a possibility. We've demonstrated it well enough. Like, I would say, I don't need any more proof that we humans can wage war. I'm convinced we can. And, and, and I don't need more proof. What I'm curious about is, can we wage peace? Like, how would that look like? And why isn't anybody busy with that? Why don't we have a minister of peace? We don't have a guy who's, who's interested in diplomacy and trying to sl slow down that, that anger and greed and visceral hatred and, and bring the conversation to another level. And I refuse to believe that we humans are so hopeless and helpless that we're doomed to some sort of a spiral of war and gloom. And I just want to say, I um, had it written, but. John Kennedy, after the missile crisis in Cuba, when we were all on tenter hooks, I was 13 at school, and our school kind of stopped that morning because we were all listening to the radio. And the teacher said, OK, let's listen to the radio today because it was that scary. There hadn't been a nuclear weapon used ever since August of 1945, but it sounded like there might be. And Kennedy said something like, uh, eight months after he made this speech, and he said something like, <clears throat> we, sh we need to be aware of the danger of humiliating uh, an opponent to the point where they would resort to nuclear weapons. And diplomacy, he was advocating conversation, was advocating, advocating movement towards peace. Rather than pushing to humiliation, he said, either we do that or we've got a collective death wish. And I think when the stakes are as high as they are now, let's make that move towards kindness. And it's so easy to do. You know, like I talk to people all the time. 
My sweet wife there will attest to that. Just today I was talking to a guy in the, in the office and we got into this great conversation which led me to mention I'd be here today. I don't think he made it, Alec Voss, but I mean, it was the same idea. I mean, of course you can. We're living in a world where people are told of all these dangers of each other. You know, don't talk to strangers, don't pick up a hitchhiker, don't do this, you know. It's ridiculous. We're all here together. Everybody's starving for a little bit of kindness, a bit of communication. And maybe, you know, when they don't get it, you know, they turn inward and they're more subject to this cult of individualism and, and substituting the wonderful fruit of the interaction and reciprocity of human relationships with, you know, I have to buy this and that because I feel bad. Oh, you know, I, I was thinking, we should make a program or show called Buyer's Regret. <laughs> we have time for one more question and it comes from me. <laughs> um, James, uh, back to the slogans, uh, which started this whole process. They say that there's no such thing as society and I reflected upon it after hearing it, and I came to the conclusion, I don't think there is such a thing as a unified concept of society. There are lots of clubs, we have the university, the colleges, and all these things, but even the city council is not unifying all of us, so is there a unified concept for Lesbridge? I couldn't identify one, I can't identify one for Canada either. Well, Here's the thing, Klaus. We're just learning. And this is one of the problems with our species, I think, is arrogance. And the arrogance of ignorance is really powerful. Um, I, I think um, that we can work towards, like Martin Luther King uh, said, the arc of history bends slowly but towards justice. I would say um, there's lots of areas we can learn from. One of the things I think we have to understand is that we learn best when we learn together, when we share our knowledge, when we share our understanding. And I just want to bring into this um, the time I spent with the Anishinaabe people in Ontario where they talked. I had the privilege of listening in a healing circle to an elder explain what she explained at that time was what she called the seven gifts. I think this is more often talk, talked about as the seven teachings. The way, it was talk, the way I understood what was said at that time was that these were gifts which were given to the humans so that we could learn to get along, so that, that would help us get along. And the one which is missing from the Western sort of vocabulary is called humility. Yeah, we don't really have humility in our lexicon of how we can learn to get along. And I think it's, it's huge. There's six others, but humility, um, to see that as a gift, and Bev, you talk like that about when you see me, it, I'm much more in humility than, you know, which, which allows me to speak from the heart. And, you know, the others we know more about, wisdom, courage, truth, honesty, love, and respect, and humility. So, I mean, we don't, like, for example, Knud, um, or Klaus, we haven't got there yet, okay? We, you know, but it doesn't mean we can't collectively, you know, search for a path there. I think a big part of that would be starting to understand that when we touch something in this world, it has connections because the world is interconnected. A lot of indigenous people know this when they speak to trying to think seven generations ahead. So you're really careful. You, don't, you just don't go ripping a mountain off to get the coal and increase your 
bank account, or I think it was Alanis Ubo so on who said something like, uh, only when the last tree has been cut down, the last river poisoned, and the last uh, something air you can't breathe, will the white man understand wealth isn't in his bank account and he can't live on money. And it's kind of, you know, the direction we choose to go in and the possibility of changing direction is real. And how we discover that, it's not an individual thing. It's, it's do we want to do this? If we want to do this, let's do it together. How do we do it? Well, let's learn how to do it, and then let's do it. That's the direction. And it's, I admit it's a kind of a gargantuan task because there's eight billion of us, and right now we bit fragmented, eh? But it doesn't mean it's not possible. James, thank you very much for enlightening us and for making us think. And I want to thank you, and please help me. Well done.